UAVs, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, are basically just aircraft without human pilots on board. Um, and they, uh, they can be as large as a plane, or they can fit in the palm of your hand. And researchers are even working on ones the size of flies. They're usually controlled by a, a, a pilot, but the pilot's on the ground controlling the UAV through a wireless link that controls the motion of the UAV or just sets GPS waypoints that the UAV can follow. But the next generation of these UAVs, they're going to have more onboard computers, more onboard sensing, more onboard processing, more onboard perception, more onboard intelligence. They're going to be flying robots. And uh, flying robots will take on ever-increasing challenges. Um, but even today, UAVs are doing some amazing, amazing things. Elderly Japanese farmers are getting help with their, um, managing their rice paddies by using UAVs to monitor crops and spray uh, pesticides and fun fungicides. They're using conservation. There's only 3,300 of these one-horned uh, rhinos in the whole world, and people still poach them, which is absolutely shocking. But with the help of UAVs, rangers are able to uh, go over, see the poachers, track them, and stop this terrible slaughter. So smile, rhino poacher. You're on UAV cam. I've been snowboarding and kiteboarding recently, and people have brought their UAVs with them. And with them, they get a unique camera angle on their extreme sporting experience. And then the uh, do-it-yourself community at DIY Drones are building very low-cost, very capable UAV systems with crowdsourcing. And um, this encourages technological literacy. It increases. Um, promote STEM careers, and uh, you know, how cool is that to be able to build a drone right in your own garage? So this is a really, really exciting field, which is why at my uh, new company, Sci-Fi Works, we're building advanced UAVs or flying robots. And these are not my first robot creations. Um, when I was 11, I went to see Star Wars, and it was there that I met my muse, R2-D2. <laughs> and I was enthralled because R2-D2 was one of the main characters. He had emotions, he had a personality, and he was able to communicate without even needing to speak. R2-D2 is more than a machine. So I went to MIT to learn to build robots, and I learned incredible things there. But I discovered pretty quickly that no one knew how to build robots, mobile robots, like R2-D2. So to fix this, and because it sounded like a blast, in 1990, I co-founded iRobot with Colin Angle and Rod Brooks. And iRobot's the company that makes the Roomba vacuuming robot and the PackBot uh, tactical mobile robots. And um, you know, getting millions and millions of Roombas into people's homes and people's lives has been an absolute dream. You know, my dream come true. And, um, you know, it's been a hit consumer product, but it's also become kind of a cultural icon. And I, I knew we'd made it when we, uh, when, you know, when I saw we were spoofed on The Daily Show, Arrested Development, and there's even a Saturday Night Live skit, which we hope you don't check out. <laughs> And, uh, but even more rewarding than that has been getting to the pack bot into the hands of soldiers, sailors, and marines, police officers, because this robot has been credited with saving the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, once I was speaking, an uh, audience like this at, uh, at the Army War College, and after my talk, a colonel comes over to me and he grabs my hand and he shakes and he says, that robot saved 11 people on one mission. And he gave me his coin, which I have here, from uh, the 63rd Ordnance Battalion, EOD. And this I really, truly will always, always treasure. Another time, General Matisse told me, as our tanks were rolling through Fallujah, there was a car blocking the intersection. So he ordered a squad of guys to go out and move it. Well, they normally would say, yes, sir. But that day, they made a counteroffer. They said, 
hey, let's send the packbot out to see what's, what, what's out there. Um, well, it turns out the call blew up, and uh, the general credit the packbot was saving that whole squad of, uh, of people. So even more recently, they were using Fukushima to go into the nuclear uh, disaster, so humans didn't have to go into radiation environment. And like everyone here, I was devastated to see a terrorist attack on the Boston Marathon. And then an MIT police officer gets shot a few days later. You know, the city goes into lockdown. And I spent the day, like all of you, <laughs> probably, um, surfing the web to see, you know, just what was going on, try and get some information. And I came across this tweet. And this tweet shows the pack butt going up to the terrorist car right after the shootout in Watertown. And um, I'm so glad this guy posted it because I was just so proud that the, um, the PACBOT was um, helping in such a chaotic and risky situation keep our police officers uh, safer. So I'm still building robots. I mean, they're just flying robots. And um, <laughs> I've noticed that people are a little bit more worried about the flying robots. Like Time Magazine, <laughs> that had a cover recently, Rise of the Drones. They're America's global fighting machines. What happens when they're unleashed at home? Da -da -da -da. <laughs> well, if I just read that, that would worry me too. But these are not the drones we are looking for. <laughs> I'd like to change this conversation. I'm going to tell you about what the UAVs, drones, flying robots will be doing for us all. Like the ground robots, a policeman with a warrant <laughs> could use a, a, a flying robot like this to get a bird's eye view of a dangerous situation and then send it in going across um, fences and over ditches, in through the window and up through the stairs and all around, staying at a safer standoff distance. They can be used in civil infrastructure, civil infrastructure inspection. This is a 90% visual job, and we spend a lot of time and money dangling people over the sides of bridges just to get their eyeballs in the right place. There are 17,000 bridges in the country that are behind an inspection, and this should be worrying because the cost of a calamity like the I-35 in Minnesota is tragic loss of lives and hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in cost. So this is something the UAVs could be helping with today. And UAVs will deliver, literally. <laughs> um, fulfillment centers are moving closer to cities. And they're, um, they want to get you that package overnight. Well, with UAV delivery, we could get you that package in 15 minutes. <laughs> and maybe even that fresh food. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, well, if UAVs can do all these incredible things, why haven't I seen any? Well, today, the FAA completely restricts the operation of UAVs across the country. Hobbyists can fly, recreational use is OK, but um, you can't fly a UAV at car level, you can't fly a UAV um, on private property, and you couldn't even fly a UAV that fits in the palm of your hands commercially. Now, this is expected to change by 2015, when they at least open up the airspace to some of these smaller uh, UAVs. And these UAVs will have cameras on board, so we do have to continue to have a discussion about privacy. But I believe it's the same discussion that we should be having about high-resolution satellites, street view, um, omnipresent cameras in cities, uh, tablets, cell phones, Google Glass, because it really shouldn't be what the camera's on, but what's it pointing at, what resolution does it have, and who gets access to the data. So I've told you about some of the things UAVs are doing overseas and for hobbyists, and I've told you about some of the things that UAVs are doing uh, today, or what they could be doing with, that, with the regulations got um, eased up. Um, but I'd like to close with what UAVs and flying robots could be doing in the future. A flying robot could swarm this litter-filled field and leave it pristine. 
a flying robot could give internet access or a cell phone reception to a person who doesn't have it yet. A flying robot could see a, um, a knapsack that's being dropped in a crowd and go to it to warn people away just in case it's a bomb, or better, swoop down and grab it with its talons and take it away from people. And flying robots will be personal devices, things you use every day. Uh, a flying robot could bring you that cool, refreshing water in the middle of a strenuous hike or um, <laughs> jog. A flying robot could walk your kids to the bus stop, keep an eye on them, and maybe even buzz back home to get the homework that they forgot. <laughs> or a, um, a flying robot um, will be able to, like a dog, play catch with you, guard your property when you're away, and um, be very, very happy to see you when you get home. <laughs> now, this is, this is beyond the state of the art today, I, I admit, but we want to create that virtuous cycle to get some of these UAVs, flying robots, uh, out there and invest in the next generation of technology because I believe with flying robot technology, the world can be safer, more efficient, and amazing. So thank you.